Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for um, the final presentation for our partner showcase day. Um, and today, um, Robert Sager will be presenting for EduTech and his presentation um, entitled Cybersecurity Risk Management, A School Leader's Burden. Um, Bob Sager is the founder and president of EduTech, an educational services firm that revolutionizes technology support and integration in independent schools across the Philadelphia area and beyond. He has presented at regional and national conversation, uh, conferences excuse me, on topics ranging from school design and planning to technology initiatives and administrative leadership. He provides strategic auditing and consulting services to independent schools worldwide for over 20 years. Bob has remained committed to the ongoing support and sustainability of small independent schools and the strategic utilization of technology and innovative tools to help them succeed. This commitment empowers school leadership and educators, enabling them to harness these solutions effectively to fulfill their school's mission. Um, presenting with him today is Robert Polini, is Willis Tower Watson's K-12 education leader for Pennsylvania, effectively managing the placement of cybersecurity insurance for over 80 private and public educational institutions. Bob, take it away. Thank you, Dina. Um... Boy, one of the things we're going to have to do is narrow down the that outline for me. That sounds like I've uh, done a whole lot of things, and it just takes forever to read. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I appreciate your time. Uh, this is going to be a very brief presentation that really focuses in on a couple of key areas uh, related to cybersecurity um, management, risk management, and the importance that the administration takes that into consideration for all aspects of the school operation. As Dina mentioned, there were several uh, in my profile. My work with independent schools uh, dates back many years, and many of you I've worked with in the past uh, that are probably participating in this session. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing as throughout this session is I'm gonna be referencing a lot about cybersecurity insurance uh, because that's a key component of the planning and the process. And with us today is Bob Pellini, who's going to be joining us in the middle of the presentation to go over some of the key factors related to cybersecurity insurance uh, needs as it ties into the preparedness of the school. So the target audience for this session uh, is focused on heads of school and boards of trustees, the, the chair for the board of trustees. And the reason for that is to help guide them and help them understand the importance that cybersecurity planning and preparedness is not an IT issue. It's not a concern specifically for the IT department. It's an operations and management issue, and it's a cyber, it's a risk management issue. So it's important that that's clear for everyone to understand. And we'll talk about some of that as we continue through the presentation. One uh, bit of disclosure on this, I'm looking at this not only from an a person that's involved from the technology side and the operations and academic side, but also as a member of a board of trustees. I'm the co-chair of the board of trustees for Hilltop Preparatory School. So for many years, um, I've been able to gain insight on how the operation of the school works from the operation side, but also then from the government so governance side as a trustee. So when looking at this agenda, we're hit four main areas, and it's really going to be able to understand just some basics about cyber threats. We're not going to go into details about cyber threats, just an overview, just to bring everybody up to speed. Again, that role of leadership and the cyber risk management and the importance of insurance and the underwriter's perspective. That's a very important part that Bob's going to touch on that I find is often lost in translation when people purchase cybersecurity insurance and think that they're covered. And then lastly, aligning cybersecurity with your overall risk management plan. How do you get this working so that you're covered and so that you prevent cyber uh, threats as much as possible? So as we start to understand the landscape, this was typically the train of thought, and I always thought this sounded very succinct and ideal when you're talking about dealing with cybersecurity and what it is, dealing with cyber threats rather, and what cybersecurity is. 
and this idea of practicing and of uh, or practice of deploying people, putting in pol place policies, putting the right technology in the back end of your organization in terms of the network and devices to try and prevent access to your systems and ultimately the data that resides on those systems. But more and more, when I look at this, I realize that it's a little bit different. It's actually a risk management. And that's where the idea of the trustees and the head of school come in. In reality, they're the ones responsible for risk management. Ultimately, they're the ones that are going to have to say to the world, here's what happened. And they're going to have to, in some ways, prove that they had the due diligence perform the due diligence and put the systems in place to mandate requ uh, response to cyber threats. So when you're thinking of the overall threats that are happening, there are three that really stand out that are the big ones right now. And these are especially true in the education market. In education, the, the idea of phishing and social engineering is huge. The, um, the greatest, it's one of the greatest challenges the schools face because it's the type of cyber attack that's orchestrated to gather information using um, what you would think of as the human factor to get to what they want. And some of those are especially a lot of that is phishing and social engineering using social media is another part of that phishing team. Many people think of phishing, they think of Okay, well, we're referring to the, um, let me, there, there we go. Uh, many people uh, think of uh, phishing as an email. That's it. So we, because you may be part of phishing training or phishing uh, testing at your school. However, that also can occur through websites and it can occur through social media and other outlets. Think of things that you've seen on Facebook as an example. Have you ever seen those quizzes where you put in information about, okay, what would you look like at 75? And they ask you to put information in. They ask you to put in your, your birth date. They may ask you to put in your location, all those things. Entering that information goes somewhere. It gets recorded and put into a database. At some point, if an organization gets to that content, or if they're just using that social media quiz as a means of gathering data, they now have access to your birth date and where you live, giving them direct access to many other elements related to your personal data. The next one is ransomware. Uh, ransomware became a popular subject line in schools many years ago, 10 years ago or more. And we saw some schools were affected by this and did receive ransomware threats that locked down their data. And if they didn't have proper backups in place, they weren't able to get to it. I do know some schools that paid ransoms. Normally we recommend they do not. And I believe insurance companies, Bob can attest to this maybe, uh, often recommend that they do not. However, if you have another choice, it may end up becoming an option that some schools have to consider. Lastly is the, brute, the idea of brute force access. This is what we used to think about all the time when we talked about uh, back in the day when we talked about um, data security, putting a firewall in place, putting the right technology, hardware and software in place to keep people from coming in. Because at the time we thought of this idea of people sitting at a desk, trying to get into these networks, finding different code to try and enter. That's kind of diminished to a certain degree, but it does still exist because believe it or not, many schools, especially small independent schools, do not have firewalls. They've been told by companies like Comcast or Verizon that it's not necessary because they have the proper software and components inside of their router that will help prevent threats from getting through. They may have that in place, but it's not nearly at the level that a new generation firewall provides in terms of threat prevention. So that's something that's still a challenge and needs to be dealt with when it comes to brute force. So when you think of ransomware, and again, this was back many years ago when this first started, look at what's happened though as a direct result of COVID. 
the ransomware attacks increased specifically during that time and then started to decrease shortly thereafter when we started to come out of it. But look at that last section, that last point of the line in 2023 started to go back up on a rise again. So this was September of 21st from the company called Comparatech. It is increasing again. So the ransomware attacks are still out there and schools, especially K-12 schools are still very vulnerable to attack. So when you think of an attack and if you actually have a breach and we'll talk about the difference between an attack and a breach and so on in a moment, here are some of the things that you really impact impacted by a breach that occurs. Um, the monetary impact. Your organization could be shut down for a period of time, losing access to data, payroll stops, uh, financial information uh, access stops, potentially access to your bank occurs. So the actual loss of funds, stolen funds, all of those things can be part of a monetary impact. The identity theft side of it, information about students, families, parents, medical data, all of those things can be part of what would eventually become an identity theft for an individual. Keep in mind, this also includes your development database. So now you have donors that may be high wealth whose identity might be out there on the web as a result of theft of data that occurs at your school. Emotional distress. This is something that's that's been documented and medically can occur from people that have been violated by a data breach. It's no different than a medical issue. If you have an injury of some type, the distress that occurs from uh, if you are, for example, robbed uh, at your home and or on the street, that emotional distress uh, can't be overlooked. It's very important to keep that in mind, especially for students. The academic impact, um, many of you have probably seen some of the things that have happened with universities, K-12 uh, districts and so on, where they're shut down for a week, two weeks at a time as a result of a breach that has occurred. And then lastly, reputational impact. This is the one for independent schools that really hits home. As you know, the, the annual pursuit of new enrollment is always a challenge. Imagine dealing with that with the potential of a reputation, reputational impact from a data breach that occurred weeks or months or a year before. And you have parents or families asking, what have you done to prepare for this and keep this from happening again? So that leads to the responsibilities, again, of the head and the board and what they're responsible for doing. And one thing I want to do throughout this session is I want to run a couple of, sorry, a couple of uh, polling questions. So I'm going to bring one up now. Let me bring that up real quick. So here's the first one. Has your school ever been the victim of a cyber crime? So we'll leave that up for a minute or two and see what we come back. Okay, good, we're getting some responses. So it looks like it's break even uh, two for each. So two of you have had a, a cyber breach, two of you have not, two that you don't know, not that you know of. And um, that's pretty typical of what I've seen. 33%, about one third of respondents that I've talked to when we do our discussions with organizations say that they have had a breach of some type and they've had some type of cyber crime. All right. One more uh, question for you. Who's responsible for the cybersecurity oversight at your school? Okay, 
So this one demonstrates a variety of responses, as you can see, it's, uh, several of them. One of the things that this question is designed to bring out and elicit responses is how many people feel that the IT department is responsible for cybersecurity. There's, when you look at this chart behind uh, that's up now, or the slide that's up now, when you start thinking about what is the responsibility, when you think of IT department, you think the responsibility is, well, they're the ones that are putting in the software in place, the hardware, the devices, the network, and so on. But ultimately, what's data responsibility? And when you look at this screen, you see information technology team listed as implementing solutions and are the custodians of the data. Then you have the data owners. The data owners are the, own the liability and establish the budget for protecting it. In the end, the data owner is the ultimate responsibility. And the data owner is the school, therefore the head and the board of trustees are the data owners. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when you think about responsibility when it comes to the data and who should be part of the planning process and structuring policies around it. And that's where you get into this outline here. Thinking of, we've always thought about a fiduciary as focused on monetary. So when you think about a fiduciary responsibility for uh, the board to make sure that no money is lost as a result of misuse of funds or other things that tie directly to dollars. In reality today, this is a level of what's called a cyber fiduciary, which focuses on the risk, not just the dollars, but overall risk and requires them to kind of demonstrate a duty to uh, to manage that risk to the greatest extent possible in conjunction with the head of school. And here are just a couple of, of thoughts from different authors over the past few years and how they view this. And most of this I find is very on target. One thing I forgot to mention when we started, all of this is gonna be available in the slideshow, including links as well as some other articles. At the end of the presentation, uh, Dina and members of the Advis team will be sending this out as part of an overall package. So that leads us to the insurance. Again, I mentioned before the idea of buying cybersecurity insurance, just like any other type of insurance, gives you that feeling of control, but also gives you that idea that you've covered yourself and you've made sure that you have the proper level of insurance for whatever the cost might be to deal with a cyber threat. However, the challenge is making sure that you meet those requirements. So I'm gonna hand that over this over to Bob now, and he's gonna step through a couple of things from the insurance side, based on his years of experience working with Willis Towers, uh, an insurance agency that many uh, independent schools in the region still use. Bob? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, <clears throat> you know, as we have these conversations, the, the focus around what we're talking about is, you know, having a holistic approach to the management of cybersecurity as well as cyber insurance and really focusing your attention on getting board engagement at the top level all the way down. And so it's, it's, it's always going to be easy to get wrapped up in the technical aspects of cybersecurity. But when having these conversations with your board, it's going to be important to frame this in ways that make sense so that they understand that this is more so about business enablement, risk mitigation, but also, you know, remediation at its core. The board is going to be interested in understanding how investments in cybersecurity will contribute to their overall operational continuity, as well as maintaining that community trust. And that goes to what Bob was saying earlier about the reputational harm that can be caused by suffering some sort of cyber breach or cyber incident. So when you're having these conversations, you want to 
you know, emphasize the potential impact that a breach is going to have on the school's reputation and the community's trust. And then you can have those conversations about how, you know, these investments into cybersecurity will ultimately have a significant impact in either reducing or avoiding the risk of a cyber threat from occurring. And so it's going to be important when you're evaluating these to have a, a, an oversight into what is going to be important when looking at your cybersecurity protocols from an underwriter's perspective and making sure that you're aligning your cybersecurity efforts with what they are most focused on. Now, over the last couple of years, as we were thrust into the pandemic and a virtual environment, we all became very familiar with MFA, multi-factor authentication. That is still going to be a critical component of your cybersecurity program that an underwriter is going to look at to make sure that it is entirely rolled out and properly implemented. And when we talk about MFA, we're talking about ways in which your employees from top to bottom can authenticate their identification through multiple facets. Um, again, it's going to be critical that you have those whenever anybody is accessing any part of your network. So that's key number one. Number two, underwriters are also going to be highly interested in how you are separating your networks, how you're segmenting them, and how you're segregating them from the internet to make sure that there are layers of protection if and when we do suffer some sort of an intrusion to make sure that we are separating out critical aspects of our network so that information cannot be shared across multiple systems. The way we do that is we segregate our networks, split them into much smaller segments so that we can isolate that particular system as being compromised and carve out all of the rest. Number one, it will drastically reduce the impact of a cyber breach. It will also drastically reduce the costs associated with a cyber breach if we can isolate it to one or two smaller network segments. So that's going to be a key aspect that they're looking at, your network segmentation and segregation. They're also going to be highly interested in how you're backing up your data, how frequently you're doing it, how you're doing it, whether it's going to be online, offline, in the cloud. Um, you know, we're not really doing any more physical backups with tapes and storing them off site anymore. But what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a regular backup cadence so that if we have a cyber breach, we have an ability to go back and rebuild that isn't several months back because ultimately that's going to increase the challenges associated with a data breach as well as the costs associated with a data breach. We're also going to want to look at whether or not you have some sort of endpoint detection and response. And what that's going to do is that's going to help your systems immediately identify when you have a breach or an unauthorized user accessing your network. And what's further is they're going to want to make sure that you have a way of responding to that by shutting down critical aspects of your network so that the, the, the information isn't being shared across multiple networks and the intrusion isn't being widespread across all of your network. So right there, we've touched on four things that are critical that underwriters are going to look at. Multi-factor authentication, network segmentation, backup procedures, as well as endpoint detection and response. There's also ways to further implement this, um, some protections that aren't necessarily critical for underwriters, but will ultimately be coming under their scope of review. Things like sender policy framework, and I know that sounds kind of foreign, but what we actually call it is meta tagging. And what that is a simple way of authenticating emails that come into your server and identifying what is coming from inside your servers, so inter-office emails, versus what's generating from outside your servers. 
So when you get those requests for things like change my direct deposit, or when you're working on a building project and you get an invoice from a vendor saying, hey, we've changed our bank information, please send the next check or wire transfer to this bank. You can very quickly and clearly identify that those generated from outside if it's a change to direct deposit. And you can also identify emails from trusted sources. So you'll immediately know if that request that came from a building vendor actually came from them or if it's coming from some other unknown email address that your system is not familiar with. We also want to make sure that we're configuring our remote desktop protocols properly to make sure that when you do have folks accessing the remote desktop that they are signing in from you know a, a vpn and they are providing multi-factor authentication you know a, as bob said a lot of those claims that we witnessed were a direct result from covid and the pandemic and being thrust into a virtual environment this has now been under the microscope for a, a couple of years now making sure that when folks are signing in from a remote location that they are being required to do so via VPN, as well as providing multi-factor authentication. And the last piece that underwriters are now heavily interested in is with regards to your PAM tools. And that means privileged access management. They wanna make sure that you're taking a hard look at who within your administration team has access to critical aspects of your network, including things like banking software, financial information, student records. We wanna make sure that we're limiting the number of people that have access to those, to those folks that are absolutely critical to have access to them. And then we're also um, providing some sort of supervisory approvals and oversight when we do make payments from those systems or generate some sort of transfer out of those systems. So those are seven critical areas that underwriters are looking at to make sure that you are doing and that you are focused on to make sure that you remain a viable prospect for cyber liability insurance. If in fact you buy insurance, and when you fill out an application, you're attesting to these things that are in place. You're saying, yes, we have MFA in place. The real question becomes, do we have it actually rolled out and implemented 100% properly? Because two or three years ago, they would ask you what aspects of your network are not subject to MFA, and then they would start excluding those specific aspects of coverage for cyber liability. Now. They're no longer asking you specifics. They're just asking you if you have MFA. We have seen situations where schools have filled out applications for coverage, attesting to the fact that they have MFA in place and ultimately suffering a breach. And when the insurance company dispatches their investigators to go back and look at how the breach occurred, what have they gotten into, what is the scope of the loss, they ultimately can determine whether or not MFA was properly implemented and whether or not MFA could have either mitigated or stopped the breach from occurring. And if they find out that you said, yes, we have MFA, but in fact, MFA was not a part of the procedure for an employee signing into their email, that claim could potentially be denied. We have seen this occur where we had schools rolling out MFA specifically for remote access when an employee was accessing the network remotely, but they did not have MFA for email when the employee was on the school's network. We saw a claim get denied because MFA was not properly in place. Specifically, uh, when we talk about cyber crime, and, and Bob had mentioned this, the social engineering aspect and the cyber crime side of coverages. We saw a large uptick in cyber crime occurring as we were coming out of the pandemic. 
And it, it, because of a direct result of the uptick in crime, cyber carriers have started adding enhancements to coverage, which pick up things like social engineering. They pick up uh, cyber crime, fraudulent impersonation, as well as fraudulent transfer and payment. We are also seeing carriers implement heavy exclusions with regards to cyber crime activity. If you get a request in, that includes an ask for changing direct deposit, or you have a building vendor that is asking you to change bank details for the next payment. If you are not doing your due diligence to follow up on that request, to make sure that that request is legitimate, the insurance companies are going to come back and say, you did not do enough to verify the legitimacy of the request, and therefore we are able to deny coverage on that basis. We are seeing this happening more and more because clients are blindly relying on these emails that are coming in. The last piece where we have seen an uptick in complications and possible denials of coverage occur when we have a situation of ransom and extortion. And when somebody comes in and takes over your system, they hold it for ransom and they extort an amount of money for you to pay to release the system back. The problem occurs when we have a extortion payment that is going to go out to a sanctioned individual or a sanctioned country. Because of OFAC requirements, we are not, as a US-based insurance company, able to make those payments to those threat actors that are on the sanctions list. And so now you have a, a failure to follow through on the insurance side to pay an extortion demand to get your system released. And why is all of this important? Because it's for these reasons that your school, the administration team, your board chair, and your board members need to be engaging with firms like Bob Sager's firm, Edutech, to make sure that you are in the best position before you experience a loss, before you experience a situation of a cyber breach, to make sure that the insurance company does not have the ability to deny your cyber claim or drastically reduce your cyber coverages in the event of these happening. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Bob. Great, thanks, Bob, I appreciate it. Uh, a lot of really good information that's critical to understand um, in so many different areas of the operational, day-to-day -day operations of the school, including, again, head of school, board chair, business office, really across the board in the administration, because that's where you start to gain momentum is when everybody realizes this is important for all of us, and we have to adhere to these requirements in order to be covered under the insurance should anything happen. Because not being covered under the insurance then leaves you with the responsibility of paying the fines, paying the recoup costs, all the other things that may not be covered under insurance if you don't have the right uh, processes and steps in place and the equipment in place. So that's going to lead to the next question we'll launch here. Do you know if the cybersecurity implementation at your school meets or exceeds your cyber policy requirements? And in order to understand that, obviously you'd have to work closely with your IT department, but you would have to be familiar with that application process. And that application process is when you first get cybersecurity insurance, but also annual renewals, you will, in, you will complete a form on behalf of your school each year. Okay, so we got some responses back. So yes, yes. Okay, good. So several people reported, yes, they did. Uh, they are aware of it. Those of you who don't know, I would recommend that you speak to your business officer because they likely hold the information about the insurance, uh, cybersecurity insurance, to talk about that the um, application to see what's in place. And I'm going to come back to another poll in a moment. It'll, it'll actually uh, talk about that. 
because you want to see if the things that are in place technically, so your, your firewall, your servers, your network, the software, the endpoint protection, for example, that uh, Bob mentioned, the uh, mobile device management, so you know where devices are at all time and who's using them. All of those things you'll, you can look into and talk to your IT department, either internally or outside, if you have someone working on it. But there are other things that immediately should be considered. One of those, uh, Bob mentioned, 2FA, which is two-factor authentication. The process you use to get into your bank, for example, to log into your bank account is two-factor authentication. You put in your ID and your password, and then it asks you, okay, where can we go to find out if this is truly you? We'll send a link with a, with a small code to this email address or to this phone number to verify that it's you. That's two-factor authentication. The other component that is important is phishing testing and training to make sure your fa faculty and staff understand what to watch for to prevent what I talked about earlier, the social engineered uh, phishing uh, emails and links. So that's a component. Those are literally the first two questions on most of the applications. Either one of those that's filled out with a no will likely result in an inability to get the insurance or compromise your ability to file a claim if you don't have it turned on. So I'm going to launch another question related to that. See if, if you can uh, identify with this. Are you familiar with a phishing process, testing, and training that goes on at your school? Has that happened where you're at? Bob, while folks are taking the, the poll, I just want to um, draw everyone's attention to we're about wrapping up in another three to five minutes. Great. Okay, so looks like it's about half and half in terms of those that know or don't know. Um, it's important to keep that in mind because that's a critical component of cybersecurity insurance is phishing, testing, and training to bring everybody up to speed. All right, so I'm gonna touch on this real quick because we're running short on time. This is an important thing to keep in mind. When they're just like anything else that happens in an organization, one person should be the primary uh, person to be able to speak to the public or speak to an issue that's happened. And one thing that I see in, that often happens is somebody may say, we've had a, a cyber breach incident or we've had a cyber breach or an attack. There's actually a difference in terminology, and uh, I'm not going to hit each one of these because it'll again be in the packet I sent to you. But it's important that someone that makes this announcement is certain what level you're at, whether it's an attack, an incident, a breach, whatever it might be. So I'm going to go through a couple of these slides quickly because we're running short on time. But I think what is important to understand is, again, it's not about the cybersecurity more than it is about the risk. So it's important to embrace the cybersecurity planning in order to mitigate risk. And that includes developing a clear and concise program. Concise program. That's a mandate for everyone. You can't adjust it for certain departments because they need to do something or they, you can't adjust it for others. Anytime you do that, it creates an element of risk because it opens up a gate. Uh, incorporate cybersecurity into your incident response, just like you do for anything else. If you have a safety committee, cybersecurity, cybersecurity should be part of that safety committee discussion each time they meet. And develop a realistic budget. You're going to need funds to do this. When you start looking at that, that's important to keep in mind, not just for the insurance, but the tools and the processes that go with cybersecurity planning. The next thing, getting it started, get an independent third party audit or analysis. Sometime in the next 90 days, schedule that for somebody to come out, do an analysis, they're there for a couple of hours, get information, and then provide you with a report. 
look for funds and grants. There are funding available. There is funding available from from federal and state level, and there are grant uh, uh, through grants. And then at this point right now, E-rate is not providing funding specifically for cybersecurity, though they might in the future. But they do provide funds for hardware and other com components that you need. So that leads to our role with the schools, uh, finding the right partner. You might already have someone you work with, that's great. Make sure that you touch base with them to make sure that it meets all the needs that you have related to cybersecurity. One of the things that we've created is a cybersecurity uh, alliance program. It's essentially a group purchasing to allow us to consolidate the costs or reduce the cost through a consolidation of effort by vetting out the right pro, uh, products, solutions that we already use. And those, those of you that are on here that are from our uh, partner schools, we already use those at your locations. And our goal is the more schools we have to take part in an alliance, the lower we can reduce the costs over time. Again, there'll be a link to all this information in the documentation that you receive after the presentation. Um, when it comes to that audit, an assessment, we we do a free audit and assessment and analysis for all independent schools in the region because we feel that it's important that everybody understands where they're at at any given point in time. And so we'll come out, we'll do the analysis, we'll provide you with a report that you can then take and look at and compare to what you think you have and then make adjustments. It may not be that you would contact us to make those adjustments. You may already be working with someone, but you'll be able to make adjustments nonetheless so that you are prepared and you're covered. And so that whatever you have in place dials in and cor correlates directly with the insurance coverage and the requirements of your insurance coverage policy that you have paid for and that you own. So with that, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer those. Bob and I'd be happy to answer those. And Dina, if you could turn that up if somebody wants to ask questions. Yeah, um, if you want to just jump off of um, mute and go ahead and ask a question, that would be great. Hey, folks, I put a couple in the chat um, that I'd love to hear the presenters' answers on. Great. Yeah, I just went into those. Uh, is this Stephen? Yes, yeah, I just you. saw that. Um, so as far as a specific network stack, yes. Uh, so there are, uh, we do have, like I mentioned, uh, at our schools where we have, I refer to as our partner schools. Those are schools where we have staff assigned to them that are uh, providing services directly to the school daily. They work their day daily. So we've used that, we've leveraged that experience to come up with products and solutions and create that alliance package that I was talking about before. So I can align you, uh, Stephen, with our uh, chief network uh, manager and engineer who can provide you with some information specific to what would help uh, in, in the situation that you have. So I can right. make that, uh, put that together to have um, Sean from our staff reach out to you. Um, uh, is there a PD curricula? Um, uh, what are you referring to in the PD curricula, like the phishing training? Yeah, phishing training, cybersecurity, uh, MFA, uh, recognizing spam and phishing messages. Um, I know that material well myself and have trained it before, um, but I'd love to save some time on the uh, authoring side or uh, like uh, or curriculum side. So if that's already created, um, I don't need to rewrite the wheel. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no reason to have to go through all that over again when it already exists. Uh, what we've done is we've we've uh, vetted out and tested several different organizations that specialize in that area. And some of them you may have worked with or heard before, uh, including uh, Know Before, which is a company that provides services uh, related to phishing testing and training. Um, there's another one called Ningio. Um, and there are a couple of products that are available through Google, if you're a Google school, that they've actually written and developed testing that you can use. It's not at the higher level that you have something like a know before, uh, but it is very good. 
So all of those are products that are competitively priced and allow two things. One provides the training. So it's ongoing independent training with recorded content, or in some cases, live content, depending upon the, uh, the type of training uh, program you sign up for, and also uh, testing. So it, you can schedule actual phishing tests that sound like they are part of your operation. So you, you actually work with them to create the test. It goes out, it records all the information, sees who clicks on what, who, what level they go to, and then it will develop a training program for that individual based on those results so that you could have, they will send, okay, these three videos tie directly into what they clicked on and shouldn't have. That will help them in theory remediate that problem and learn specifically what it is they needed to hear. So yes, that's something that's available. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but also, Stephen, you, you may want to check with your cybersecurity insurance provider because they do have some uh, what we'll call pre-loss services that you can engage with them on. Now, they may be at a cost to you, but they usually have some preferred rates or discounts that are available if you work with vendors that they have previously vetted. Um, and there's definitely resources out there through your insurance company that you can uh, engage with in terms of doing things like phishing, um, you know, simulations as well. Thank you very much. One thing that that reminded me of that I didn't run the poll, one poll I did not run, I wanted to put that up there is this one. So I just want to use this as a reference. You can answer it if you'd like, but I just want to use this as a reference. This is a question that comes up regularly. Who do we call? If we feel confident that we've had a breach, a true breach, someone has done something that's resulted in the loss of money or potentially data has been uh, breached and somebody's looking at it, who do you feel is the first place you call? So I'll put that up there and see if anybody else wants to respond. So when you look at this, the first thing that most schools think of is, okay, I'm going to do what somebody put on there, call the police, or I'm going to call, I need to call the schools before they do anything. And this is just a pretty typical response as a school leader, as an administrator, I'm going to call our school council and get their input, see what to do next. I, I trust in them, they're on retainer, they know what to do, they should know what to do, I'm going to call them first. Some people might do that. That's fine. But in reality, the first place you should be calling is your insurance company. Because it's not up to you to remediate this problem and get coverage from it for it by the insurance company. And Bob can step in in a moment and speak to this directly. They will take the process on from the moment you call and say, here's what we're going to do. They'll take the lead. They have their own legal uh, representation. They have their own cyber uh, forensics teams. They have their, all of that is part of your policy that you have with them that you need to utilize because you want them to be able to say, yes, we use the companies that we've vetted and we know work. And they took the steps to try and get this resolved. Here's what the costs were to pay them and they get that paid. You never want to have your own IT team start searching for things or shutting down servers or resetting things and doing things when you know that there's been a breach because that limits the ability for the forensics team to investigate and find clues to how this happened or remediate what happened. Yeah, um, Bob, any other thoughts you, on that? Go ahead, I'm sorry. All right, I'm going to step in um, here just because I want to be respectful of everyone's time because we're we've already run about ten minutes over. Um, so perhaps if if you want to stay on a little bit longer to hear 
um, some of the uh, ask other questions or hear the remainder of this answer, please feel free to do that. But um, I'm going to say thank you to everyone for joining us for our showcase. And I'm also going to drop um, a link in the survey for those of you that are here. Um, please, your feedback is valuable. It helps us to create programming that is um, useful for everybody. Um, so please take only a few minutes to fill that out and that will be helpful. Um, again, I wanna thank Bob and Bob from EduTech and everybody for joining us today. If you wanna stay on, please do. Otherwise have a wonderful um, rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Dina. Thank you. you. Know, just piggybacking off of Bob's thoughts with regards to notifying the insurance company. When you do have a data breach, it is extremely important to consider timing. Getting out in front of it as soon as possible is going to be critical to helping minimize or mitigate the overall damage that is caused by a data breach. Um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, you're buying cyber liability coverage for, yes, you have the liability protection that's provided by the coverage, but more so you're buying the policy for the data breach team to be boots on the ground in the event that you have a breach so that they can understand what happened, understand the scope, and get involved with the legal team immediately to identify what you are required to do and how quickly you're required to act. That's really why you're buying the insurance. Great, that's good information, Bob. And that was always a question that came up every time that I've seen an incident occur at a school is, who do we call? first and when do we call and we've had schools that have said you know let's wait to see what the extent of the damage is let's wait to see if it's something we can resolve ourselves and not have to file a claim let's wait whatever it might be so they'll wait a week in some cases before they actually respond it might be too late at that point if you wait that long to try and get insurance coverage or in insurance help. They're going to try and help, but it may be beyond what they can do to gather certain information through your forensics evaluation. 